First, I basically can't believe I'm here. Uh, Heartland must be really dragging the bottom if they're uh, getting speakers literally off the street to speak, and that's essentially me. Uh, I'm not a, I have nothing to do with science. Uh, I'm not a professional speaker. I've literally never done this before in my entire life. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not a trained speaker like the Al Gore people are, but I'm hoping if I can do this, then everybody in the room can ask tough questions about this. Everybody in the other rooms can ask questions. The people who are watching this on live streaming video can do the same thing I am. What I try to have done is that uh, originally when I started out with this, uh, I wanted to find out why the mainstream media was skipping uh, skeptic climate scientists from their, their media presentations. And when I first got into this in 2008, uh, all I did was basically ask like the people in the PBS NewsHour, uh, why is it that they have not had a skeptic climate scientist on their program in 18 some years? And they couldn't give me a straight answer on that. And I tried asking the governor of Arizona, Janet Napolitano at that time, why were we proceeding with a cap and trade plan uh, without giving any credit to the skeptic client scientists? Why were they doing that? And they couldn't give me a straight answer on that. And the more I looked into that, the more I ran across, um, basically from uh, various different elected officials, the number one talking point of global warming issue, which is the science is settled. You don't need to listen to skeptics. They're not important. Uh, and I did that for about a full year. I was trying to find out why the, the Western Climate Initiative was going forward. But the more I looked into it, the more I saw at other media outlets, um, uh, commenters at websites, the number two thing they always said was, well, don't listen to skeptic climate scientists. They're paid crooks. They're, they're, they receive money from the fossil fuel industry. And I ignored that at first because that, to me, that's not even, uh, that's intellectually uh, ridiculous. Uh, they, they speak about the, the science facts. Who cares where they get their money from? And I couldn't find any indication that they'd been getting millions and millions of dollars for that. Um, but the more I heard that, the more I decided to try and figure out where that number two piece came from. And ultimately, when I uh, started trying to find out where that was, I kept running across this one phrase, the scientists are out to reposition global warming as theory rather than fact. And one of the places where I found that was at was in Al Gore's movie. He basically, the, the first hour and 12 some minutes is all about the settled science. But then he said very briefly, well, the skeptics are out there, haven't done peer reviewed uh, literature, and he quoted Naomi Oreskes, good old Naomi. And then he spelled out completely across the screen of the movie that skeptic scientists were exposed by a leaked coal industry memo that they were paid to reposition global warming as theory rather than fact. And in Al Gore's companion movie book here, he spells that out in just a little bit more detail. He says, one of the internal memos prepared by this group, meaning the deniers, uh, to guide their employees they hired to run their disinformation campaign was discovered by the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Ross Gelbspan. Uh, here was the group's stated objective to reposition global warming as theory rather than fact. Well, I looked that up a little bit further. Who was Ross Gelbspan? I'd never heard of him before. He wrote a 1997 book called The Heat Is On. You can see I've read the book thoroughly. I have all kinds of notes in this. I've really wrecked it with internal notes. But same thing again. On page 34, he says, the Information Council on the Environment was the creation of a group of utility and coal uh, companies in 1991 using the Information Council on the Environment, ICE. The coal industry launched a blatantly misleading campaign on climate change that had been designed by a public relations firm. A uh, public relations firm clearly stated that the aim of their campaign was to reposition global warming as theory rather than fact. Uh, with all the sophistication of modern marketing techniques, the ICE campaign targeted less or older, less educated men and young, low-income women. And part of the group that was associated with this was Robert Balling, Pat Michaels, and Fred Singer. That's kind of an important little point right there because in his one year later paperback version of this, uh, he said, 
and watch this. Same thing, all that stuff about reposition global warming theory rather than fact is plan that there was three of the so-called greenhouse skeptics, Robert Balling, Pat Michaels, and Sherwood Idso. What happened to Fred Singer? He was just, he basically just accused him of being involved in something where he's paid and he just disappears and he never says why he made that change in this book. Now, Ross Gelbspan first mentioned that reposition global warming is theory rather than facting in a 1995 NPR radio interview. Same thing. Uh, the coal industry uh, launched a disinformation campaign designed to reposition global warming as theory rather than fact. They used the three so-called skeptics, Balling, Michaels, and Sherwood. It's a, well, he got it right apparently in 1995. Uh, uh, in their, let's see, in broadcast appearances and newspaper columns designed to target older, less educated men and low-income women. Now, I had this bookmarked in this particular book for a reason. Here's Al Gore's 1992 book. Remember, back here in Al Gore's movie companion book, he said Ross Gelbspan discovered that. Watch this. On page 360 of Earth in the Balance, three years before Ross Gelbspan ever mentioned anything to do with those memos, Al Gore said, documents leaked from the National Coal Association to my office reveal the depth of cynicism involved in the campaign. One of their campaign strategies was, people who respond most favorably to such statements are older, less educated males from lower income households, it kind of goes on to that, and younger, low income women. Al Gore had those memos that he said Ross Gelbspan discovered three years before Gelbspan ever mentioned that. Now, I don't know what that means exactly, but that's something to ask questions about. And what it ultimately turns out when you look into that ICE uh, PR campaign from 1991, it wasn't this sinister top-down industry directive uh, where skeptic scientists were paid and told what to do. It was just a little bitty PR campaign that nobody ever saw. It was in Fargo, North Dakota, Bowling Green, Kentucky, and uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. If you blinked, you probably never saw it. And there, uh, there go on at much longer length about that. Every, everywhere you look into the accusation, it doesn't line up right. The, the sequence of events, the people involved in it, uh, Ross Gelbspan, on the cover of his 2004 book, Ross Gelbspan, winner of the Pulitzer Prize. He never won the Pulitzer Prize. That's a little problem, don't you think? Now, what I want to leave you with is just these couple of images um, as to really set this in your mind, what's wrong with the overall issue, because this is the way it looks to me. I love this photograph. Uh, uh, Michael Shinnemann from the Arizona Republic. Uh, ignore that those aren't actually climate people there, a fat cat, but that's the quintessential picture Fat cat running from reporter, fat cat can't answer tough questions. Now, the mainstream media, as you probably have already noticed, are not asking, say, visualize the, the guy there as Al Gore. They're not asking him tough questions. They're nowhere to be seen asking him, how come these things that you've said about the accusation that skeptics are crook, how come you never offered an iota of proof to prove that? How do you explain that? But use your imagination a little bit. The, the lady reporter there chasing the fat cat, that could be Joanne Nova. That could be uh, Donna LaFramboise chasing Rachenda Pershari of the IPCC. Um, the fat cat there, that could be Michael Mann. And uh, use your imagination a little bit, that could be uh, Steve McIntyre chasing him. Why can't you answer questions? Look across all the way, everywhere you look, when these guys, uh, you ask them tough questions, they run away. And even when I ask the people who are in love with the global warming stuff, well, how do you prove skeptics are crooks? Where's your proof? They run away. And one of my other favorite punching bags is the PBS NewsHour. I have asked them for years now, why don't you have skeptic climate scientists on your program? They can't answer the question. And that's a major problem. And that's why maybe all the rest of the, the skeptics are having trouble getting their information out because the, the mainstream media does not want you to see that because um, 
if there's one thing they don't want the public to do is to lose faith in the, the idea that skeptics are crooks and that the science is settled. And what I want to close with is this one last image. Uh, that's what I have at my Facebook page. Um, all I've ever done, all Andrew Breitbart has ever done, all everybody else has ever done is ask the, the media to solve their bias problem. And as a result of that, when they didn't solve their bias problem, we said, if you don't solve it, we're going to form a new media in the wake of your incompetency. And I'm just a knucklehead off the street. That's what I try to do. That's what Mark does. That's what CFAC does. That's what Heartland does. That's what all of you guys can do is you may not know the science necessarily, but you can ask tough questions, and you can ask them to provide you with answers. And I don't know if we might be able to win it that way, but we have to keep them on their toes because they want the public to think settled science, don't listen to skeptics. So I'm, I'm honored to be here. Sorry about my spacing out whatever it was I was going to say, but whatever it was, it was good.